Good evening, and thank you very much for coming on this beautiful night. It was almost raining earlier, and I thought nothing better to do on a rainy night, but sunny night, I, I really owe you all. Um, I'd like to thank the Craft Council for inviting me to present my work, particularly Rain Mackay, who oversaw so many of the details. I'd also like to thank Liz Wiley for her many conversations on making and presenting art, and for my husband, Ray Gogarty, who put up with me and um, helped me when I needed it most. While I have made art for over 50 years, most of my public career has been in writing and presenting about other artists. I only rarely talk about my own work. To give context, I will briefly describe my education in the visual arts and show some of my earlier work. I was born and raised near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and attended one year of college in Massachusetts. In 1973, I emigrated with my husband to Canada. I studied painting at the Alberta College of Art, later ACAD, and now AU Arts in Calgary, Alberta. Following several years of working as a textile technician, gallery attendant in an artist-run center, and exhibiting my work, I returned to grad school at the University of Calgary, earning an MFA in painting in 1989. In 1990, I began to teach visual art history and theory in liberal studies at ACA. ACA AU Arts has four strong craft-based departments, textiles, metal and jewelry, glass, and ceramics. Our history courses aim to incorporate these media into the curriculum. I was asked to teach the history of ceramics, which was my dream job. My students insisted that if I were going to teach the history, I had better learn to make ceramics, mm -hmm. which led to a love affair with the medium that has continued to this day. Fortunately for me, I lived very near a city-run facility that ran workshops and that had member studios for high fire gas, soda, and wood counts, very similar to the Shad Bolt, uh, except two blocks from my house. So I was able to develop my skills. Um, during my time in Calgary, I exhibited my paintings locally and at times nationally. My paintings are based on informational or encyclopedia images and historically overlooked or marginalized paintings, all of which provide insight into prevailing ideologies and cultural constructs operating at the time they were made. Rather than sell my paintings, I kept them as an archive, adding to them as different exhibition opportunities arose um, and uh, presented themselves. Exhibitions consisted of installations of both new and older works, organized around particular themes relating to gender, science, representation, ideology, and other areas of interest to me at a given time. So, uh, for example, um, Swan and Plenty, which is the top one, um, I had all the images on the one wall. On the opposite wall, I had all of the information about the source of the image, and I had garden benches and binoculars so you could sort of sit in the park and view them. Uh, down below was at, it's a little dark, I'm sorry, it's back in the age of, of slides rather than digital. Um, so it was in a, um, a museum in the university, so I borrowed from the collections of the biology and the zoology and uh, the classical history departments and then installed my paintings around the ideas of what constructed knowledge in the university. Um, uh, eventually, um, I began to improve my skills with ceramics, so I began to include uh, ceramics into some of my pieces. So again, a little hard to see, but these, um, the long lines of text were ceramic tiles that I sandblasted letters into, and I incorporated other things like that. I had um, video and audio and things, other bits and pieces with that. And then I also uh, did a lot of China painting. So uh, the China painting was all based on historical images. Uh, the one on the left is based on um, Rubens' uh, Wolf and Fox Hunt, and then I used commercial crockery and used laser decals and texts from Milton and the Bible about how we have total dominion over animals and can do everything we want, like kill them and eat them, and of course, I don't really agree with that, but I mm -hmm. use them as sort of ironic statements on this very sort of elegant tea services. And then uh, on the right, I had done an exhibition that was at the Medicine Hat Museum and Library about, um, it was basically about blindness, and um, I looked for all sorts of texts in books and encyclopedias and dictionaries, poetry that had to do with blindness, and the texts I made about 50 plates, 
the texts were on the plates and like the little drawing on that plate is a drawing by a blind person of a glass and then the poem um, is by Gertrude Stein that doesn't really make any sense but it's talking about a blind glass so all of these things were then installed in the library shelves and in the museum so those were the kinds of things I was doing uh, in 2006 I moved to Vancouver to work as an independent educator and writer artist and artist I wasn't sure if I was going to continue to make ceramics as I no longer had access to a convenient studio. In 2009, I was invited by Medalta to participate as a writer in residence at their newly opened studio. I was expected to write about the new studio and international artist residency program, which I did, but I was also given access to my own space. This experience cemented my interest in continuing to work in ceramics. Upon returning home, I began to assemble my own studio. I developed connections with the Vancouver ceramics community through the Potter's Guild of BC, sitting on their board for several years, and with the Northwest Ceramics Foundation, on which board I continue to very happily sit. I continue to write and present publicly about ceramics, theoretical issues in craft, reviews of exhibitions, etc., which kept me in contact with the broader visual arts and crafts community. Prior to its closing in 2018, I marketed my functional works through the Gallery of BC Ceramics. This work uh, shown here is electric fired mid-range stoneware, which I cover with and center on a satin glaze. Centering, and I know not all of you are ceramists, so ceramists, please forgive me if I give a little bit of the sausage making here. Um, centering involves firing the glaze to a low temperature, which stabilizes but does not fuse the glaze. I then take it out into various city parks in the surrounding countryside on my bicycle or walking and um, uh, paint plein air using underglaze as much as you would use paint. I never lost my interest in painting and this allowed me to combine the two media. It also gave me a way to explore my city and the interface between human activity and the natural world. And this is a series of very large vases that I did of specific areas in the city where the new city was coming in with the cranes and the large buildings and the older city with the community gardens and uh, older houses were still both there. After the gallery closed, I realized I was not interested in doing craft fairs or online sales. I began to look for other ways to work in ceramics. The long winter months were not conducive to plein air painting and I had little interest in working from slides. So I began to make sculptural works. This required me to develop entirely new glaze palettes, which I was able to explore during a second residency at Medalta in October of 2018. And then COVID hit. I heard someone else say that earlier too. COVID hit. Yes. Uh, I know that COVID was horrible for very many people with the human suffering, death, isolation, and uncertainty that affected so many. But for me, it was an opportunity to slow down be in my studio, focus on my work, and accept that I was not in control of my world. I found this very liberating, and I began to work on a series of pieces relating to consumption and the worldwide circulation of goods. Numerous artists have addressed this topic. Uh, here's one I particularly like by an artist named Duke Riley, whose murals on Governor's Island in the waters off Manhattan depict historical icons and cargo ships in single-use plastic containers rather than in the beautiful glass bottles typically used for ship in a bottle works. The title, Not for Nutton, refers to Paganuk, or Nut Island, which was the name given to the island by the Lene Lenape, who valued the island's many hickory, oak, and chestnut trees. Weaving together historical and contemporary events with a strong sense of place, Riley's work engages the public in a very thoughtful dialogue. The pandemic contributed to the global upsurge of online retail, as enforced isolation encouraged the consumption of goods to replace relationships lost with people. Many began to rethink their consuming habits and strategies. Marie Kondo promoted her KonMari method for decluttering one's possessions. And I have to acknowledge the fact that my house does not look anything like <laughs> the top. Looks a little bit more like the bottom there. <laughs> The Swedish death cleanse sensitized people to issues around performing end-of-life tasks to lessen burdens for surviving family members. 
For years, advocates recommended ways of ethical consumption, how ethical consumption can impact global environmental and social justice issues. A recent New Yorker discussed the feasibility of fashion designers paying royalties for the use of animal prints to agencies working to protect animals like tigers, leopards, and exotic snakes. Now, whenever I walk around the city and notice animal prints, I, I really wonder if the designers perhaps did pay that royalty. I, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> These all relate to lifestyle issues. A clean and organized house is more attractive. Wearing clothing with an ethical label has public cachet. I'm actually more interested in thinking about how my own consumption impacts the environment, which is ultimately more important than how I, how I and my possessions are perceived by others. Writing in the New York Times, Erin Aubrey Kaplan suggests that the trauma of the pandemic fostered her obsession with connecting her actions to wider global events. She notes that although people are returning to retail outlets, quote, many of us are also feeling the urgent need to keep tabs on everything going on, to connect the dots of current events from one day to the next, even from one hour to the next. I want progress more than I want stuff, a change that I think will last." Unquote. In the day the world stops shopping, J.B. McKinnon proposes a thought experiment in order to examine the costs of consumption. Global consumption paused during the pandemic, allowing those of us in the developed world to see what we can live without. According to the United Nations, overconsumption has surpassed overpopulation as the greatest driver of our eco-crisis. How and how much we consume directly impacts the state of the world. Although we feel good about banning single-use plastics, plastic production will expand by 40% in the next decade. Economists argue that we should be spending our way out of the pandemic, insisting that if we slow or stop our consumption, much as what happened during COVID, the world economy will collapse. McKinnon, however, urges us to consider what a de-consumer economy might look like. What else could we be doing if we were not consuming and working to support that consumption? And how can we break the cycle of binge consumption and move towards a more rational equilibrium? His urgent appeal raises questions I also consider in this work. Eventually we'll get to my work. <laughs> I'm good at procrastinating. All consuming was influenced by two specific visual references, one art historical and one contemporary. During the 17th century, a period referred to as the Golden Age, the Dutch became the most economically wealthy and scientifically advanced of all European nations, dominating both European and international trade. During this time, they perfected the art of still life painting, developing a variety of styles to convey a range of moral meanings. Ostentatious still life paintings called bankages featured tables overflowing with rare, costly, and often foreign foodstuffs. While even more elaborate, Prankstilleven included sumptuously crafted objects such as silver platters, glass beakers, musical instruments, and exquisite textiles. These paintings flaunt the owner's wealth and status while making pious, if hypocritical, pronouncements about the vanity of possessions, the brevity of life, and the need to turn one's mind towards salvation. To contemporary viewers, the paintings offer tantalizing evidence of quality craftsmanship and the extent of global trade in exotic animals, foodstuffs, and consumer goods. At the same time, the precariously overladen tables and half-eaten foodstuffs suggest dangers inherent in unregulated capitalism and overconsumption connected with global empire, if that sounds familiar. <laughs> Container ships form a second visual reference for my work. Lined up in harbors or stuck in narrow shipping lanes, overladen ships spawn social media memes. I've got uh, the, the ships, and I think this is an interesting satellite photo. I can show you up there. Uh, interesting satellite photo of all of the ships backed up with the supply chain issues. Uh, and I quite love this uh, little yeah. meme about, <laughs> you know, it, it was sort of overnight sensation. Uh, rep but at the same time, they represent serious economic and political challenges. And of course, you all recognize the barge. 
I began looking at the piles of containers that I organize each week for my recycle bin and thought about how ceramics, with its history as containers, bears a connection to the plethora of used product containers in my bin. News stories describe masses of plastic bottles circulating in the ocean, fouling beaches, or piling up in landfills. Online orders arrive swathed in packaging, adding to the waste we produce. Daily reports of fires, floods, droughts, tornadoes, and other climate-related disasters exacerbate a depression brought on by the pandemic. This depression actually has a name, solastalgia, grief for what has changed or is changing for the worse in our environment. Gradually, my work turned to both reflecting on the situation and questioning how we might control our obsession with stuff. In a civilization that survives on production, circulation, and consumption, how can we conserve our resources, lessen our destruction of the environment, and learn to live in greater harmony with the natural world? Well, I'm not here to tell you, because I wish I knew. When I started to make sculptures, I wanted to continue throwing my forms. For me, throwing, oh sorry, like many people in my own life, I try to reduce, recycle, reuse, walk, bicycle, and avoid waste. My work speaks to the appeal of stuff. The tubes and cans piled onto the ship forms are luscious. The colors and surfaces alluring. However, the objects piled on the ships are discarded wasted and destined to add to the massive detritus threatening to engulf us. When I started to make sculptures, I wanted to continue throwing my forms. For me, throwing and altering constitutes a sort of drawing in space. The energy the wheel imparts creates an organic liveliness that cannot be replicated through making with slabs or modeling. And I know those who work with slabs and modeling will disagree, but this is my feeling. And it imposes a sort of liveliness it also imposes a discipline or limitation on forms. As I was interested in how ceramics are implicated in issues of waste and consumption, beginning my sculptures on the wheel also emphasized connections with traditional ceramics practice. Although individual pieces begin on the wheel, I freely alter, stretch, add to texture, or otherwise work the thrown form to create my finished components. And again, a little bit more of the sausage making for people who are not ceramists. Um, I work with a range of mid and low fire glazes. Prior to glazing, I sit with my scores of glaze samples deciding how each piece wishes to be glazed, and I often fire pieces many times to achieve the exact color and surface I want. In this way, I am able to bring my lifelong interest in painting to bear as I evaluate compositions in terms of color, form, scale, surface, and effect. Sometimes I have a clear idea of how I want the finished sculpture to look, but generally, I surround myself with the, my components and begin a process of play. I combine pieces, photograph them, observe them sometimes for months, and often disassemble and rearrange parts to create completely different compositions. Some pieces have holes or fittings for hardware, which facilitates the assembly of larger constructions. Other pieces fit into spaces left by or beside the secured components. My ship forms are arranged in a flotilla. The arrangement is busy, noisy, and slightly chaotic, which reflects the busy movement and activity of the nearby Burrard Sound, False Creek, the harbors, and ports that are so central to Vancouver's economy and culture. Individual pieces are open to interpretation, but several, such as Omicron and Trans Mountain, point to connections between our dependence on fossil fuels, pollution, and disease. It is important for me to reflect and implicate my specific environment and city, and not to locate these issues in some sort of abstract space. The walls to the gallery are lined with circular forms resembling portholes, which are painted with scenes drawn from this region. I wanted to play with the perceptions of the body in relationship to the work. First, while looming over and contemplating the ships as might a giant or omniscient being, I was thinking about model train sets, toy sailboats, films about World War II or naval museums where fleets of model warships are moved about on large tabletops. Alternately, I was conceiving of the gallery as the interior or hull to a ship, with the portholes providing views out to other ships, the surrounding industrialized landscape, and the shoreline. 
Land pieces incorporating logs, branches, or small boats that might travel on rivers and streams sit along one side of the gallery, which I conceptualized as a shoreline. Piles of detritus surround these pieces, blurring boundaries between the artworks, quote unquote, and their environment. The piles replicate situations all too frequently hidden from sight in forests, landfills, and dump sites that cover the earth. Walls with indentations and lumpy glazes uh, suggest the coronavirus lurking amidst the waste. In both the water and the land pieces, human heads are present as witnesses to the destruction. Some appear watchful while others sleep and dream. Of what? A better world? Some are upside down, a universal symbol of the world out of order. Still others project out of the earth like ancient giants, their heads pierced with funnels into which tubes, cans, branches, plastic sheeting all tumble. The funnels, based on ceramic funnels used since medieval times in the production of sugar, represent the entry point for all the information, misinformation, anxiety, prejudice, and darkness we allow into our heads. Somehow, we have to learn to manage what we take in and what we do with it. The sculptures are imbued with a sense of instability. Objects are piled together or balanced precariously and some works feel as if they might fall apart or arrange themselves differently at a future moment. I am attracted to compositions constructed from multiple parts. The precariousness captures the way I and many others feel as we face a world altered by pandemic, environmental threat, and now war. This sense of instability also reflects my grounding in craft theory and practice. While fine art objects derive their value from their supposed uselessness and autonomy, Craft objects originate in and celebrate their connection to human comfort, safety, usefulness, and pleasure. We move crafted objects around in space without affecting their identity or function. We organize crafted objects within domestic spaces or on our bodies to create pleasing arrangements. Crafted objects are intimate and deeply relational to each other and to us. We handle crafted objects with pleasure, enjoying their materiality and sociability. Acquiring individual pieces over time, we use them in a variety of situations that give meaning to specific arrangements. Functional ceramics bring a host of associations and histories to a table, but the occasion and use complete the meaning. My relationship with crafted objects governs my approach to organizing and presenting my sculptures as objects open to mobility and change. Works assume meaning through context. Individual components carry shadows or traces of meaning, but that meaning is inflected and shaped by what else is present in a composition. My compositions operate through associations and synecdoche, parts representing a whole, which allows numerous ideas to be present even in a simple collection of items. The longer I work on these pieces, the more unstable, dissolute, or provisional they become, echoing perhaps the increased fragility, instability, and provisionality I experience as life veers further and further away from my expectations. I am hopeful that this sort of arrangement allows individual viewers to read or project what it is that interests them into the work and that the viewing encourages self-reflection. I would like to thank you all for your interest in my work and I look forward to speaking to any of you individually or if there are any questions, answering them at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, does anyone have any questions right now? Is this show on here now? Yes, it is. Across the street. Yeah, we're all going to head over uh, after this is done. All, all right. right. Any other questions? <laughs> all right. I like that. I, I like I that. I have a question, actually. Amy, sure. You know so obviously you're talking about you know centuries of consumption, and obviously there's there's a heavy overlap with uh, colonialism and, and things like that. I think it's interesting that you know we've gone on, like I said, for centuries, for years and years of just consuming, consuming, and that's you know exponential. But now with the pandemic and having so many things on pause, do you think that's really going to give people a good reflection on what we really need in our lives and what we don't? Well, I think that's what a lot of the writers I've been reading have said, because on the one hand, the government, the politicians, the corporate leaders all say, go out there and consume. It was sort of like after 9-11, uh, you know, when the towers came down and George Bush came out and said, get out there and go shopping, guys. Yeah. <laughs> this will fix it. 
Um, I, I, incur I have encountered so many people that really were v have become very thoughtful after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it, granted if they weren't, you know, if they didn't experience something horrific, which many people did, I'm not minimizing that. But for many people, it just made them stop and think. And again, we live in a capitalist society. You're not going to turn it off. But also, if you look at the graphs at consumption and how it's contributed to the carbon footprint, it suddenly went suiting up. You know, maybe we can curve that down and find things that are important. Obviously, an advertisement for the Craft Council. Maybe you could buy beautiful things handmade by people instead of, you know, yeah, that's right. So I, I think so. I think crafts people are very well positioned to be thinking about this. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions at all? Bring back courses. Bring back courses. Yes, why not? Tatiana, yes. Uh, uh, definitely. I mean, when I did my paintings, they're all on plywood. And I had, you know, intense guilt about what am I doing cutting down trees and making paintings that are going to sit in my studio. I think it's just something you have to come to grips with on your own and say, this is more. I mean, the nice thing with clay, I can throw a million things and not fire them. And then when I don't like them, turn them back into clay. Um, and on the other hand, there's always you know, my back alley is a place where I put a lot of things out and somebody comes along and takes them. But I mean, I just, yes, you see, them? yes, that's true. Absolutely. And the Salvation Army, and, you know, um, I just think it's something you have to evaluate and you have to ask yourself really seriously. Am I making something that I really feel contributes something to the world? Or is it really not something? And I, I don't think it's wrong to decide you don't want to do that anymore. I, I don't think it's wrong at all. But if you are driven to make it, it's also who you are and what you do. So I, I don't think you need to apologize. I remember at the, um, where I used to work at North Mount Pleasant in Calgary, you know, there was a lot of concern about whether the wood uh, kilns were making smoke and contributing to pollution and the soda. And the uh, fire department and a couple of environmental assessment people came and did a study on the road going by the center. And the road produced like a hundred times more dastardly fumes than the kiln firing. So sometimes we overestimate. On the other hand, I think a lot of, uh, particularly ceramics, because we're probably one of the worst for uh, carbon footprint. They've developed uh, clays that are lower firing. Cone 6 clay is a lower firing than cone 10. Uh, a lot of people work in earthenware. A lot of people work with unfired work as a way. So I think everyone finds their way around. But I would definitely encourage you to keep making work. <laughs> Anyone else? And I'll be over next door, so if you have questions, come and ask me. But thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. Time.